Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Employees as an Asset, presented by Dean Hill and Toby Pochran. Before I hand you over, I just say if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A function for Toby and Dean to answer. If there's any technical issues throughout the webinar, please put them in the chat function for myself. And I'll hand over to Dean. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join the second in a series of Freeth's advanced webinars that focus on de-risking your business and achieving growth. For those of you who were unable to attend our first webinar, never fear as it's available online via the Freeth's YouTube channel. Uh, today's webinar will also be available and we will provide you with all the relevant links as a follow-up to today. At the risk of repeating my introduction from our first webinar, at Freeth's, we appreciate running a business is never easy, pandemics notwithstanding. And Freeth's Advance is our answer to these difficulties and is a fixed price, fixed time review of the essential contractual paperwork that every company needs to thrive. It provides a health check in terms of legality and risk and identifies areas where improvements can be made so that you can concentrate on growing your business. With this in mind, employees are arguably your biggest asset and key employees are an important, important ingredient in your secret sauce, helping to refine the recipe as you go along. I always remember a very successful client once telling me that a business is only as good as the people it employs. And with this adage in mind, it's important for a business to look after its employees, which is essential for it to protect its asset. Key people leaving a business is never an easy issue to deal with and Toby and I constantly see people leaving a business to set up in direct competition around the corner. This has never been more prevalent than in the current market um, and what we are seeing is that employment contracts that are legally up to date and fit your particular circumstances are an essential part of minimising the risk that can come with a workforce and also maximizes the strength of your position when people inevitably do leave. You cannot keep everyone happy in their role, but what you can do is prevent them from walking out the door and using their knowledge against you. With this in mind, and at this point, I'll hand over to Toby, who, who will give you the good news that there are proactive steps that you can take to minimize your risk and protect a most valuable business asset. That was a lovely introduction. Thanks, Dean. I think I think I need to take a, a quick second just to uh, acknowledge the um, the secret sauce analogy. Not heard not heard that one before. Secret sauce, key for your recipe. I like it a lot. I would you know I didn't know that you were going to say that. So I think throughout my talk now, I'm going to try and drop in some sort of recipe analogy on every single bullet point. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see where we get. So good morning. Um, good morning. Gosh, I wish my life away. Good afternoon, um, everybody. So my name is Toby Pochran. I'm an employment law sister here at Freeth's. Um, so I've been drafted in by, by Dean today to go through a bit more of the key uh, employment law provisions that you're going to want to put in your contracts of employment to help you to de-risk your business and to protect confidential information, trade secrets, assets, business structures, from any unfair competition from employees. So I think what I'm, what I'm not gonna to touch on today are the basic minimum parts for a contract of employment. You know, the, the amount of pay that person is gonna get, the amount of hours that they should be working, their holiday entitlement. What we're looking at here is having that core structuring for your arrangements to protect, it says it on the screen here, confidentiality, intellectual property, preventing unfair competition, and then some uh, pr practical tips to stopping employees from competing during their employment. So as we go along, as Tom said at the start there, there is a Q&A function at the bottom. If you have any questions as we do along, please do whack them into there. And then I think at the end, our compare, Mr. Dean Hill, will be uh, dividing those up between us and we'll answer them as we can. So if we just flip on to the very first slide, Amazing, that worked absolutely seamlessly. Um, so the first one we're covering off here is uh, protecting confidentiality. So confidential information means different things to different businesses. So, you know, the, the key aspect of confidential information is something that would be important for a business to retain. So that can be, and most oftentimes it is, a customer list, 
a supplier list, engagements that you have with individuals that allow you to trade with them. And it would be the case if you had a, you know, a list of all your customers, your clients, and the individual took that away with them, then it's likely that you're going to be pretty upset. It's like it's kind of fundamentally damage your business. Now, there are four different types of business information that you can protect. So trade secrets is probably the most commonly known one. So a trade secret is something that's absolutely core, fundamental to your business. Now, a trade secret in and of itself would be something like the recipe for Coca-Cola, the, the secret blend of herbs and spices that go along with KFC chicken. You know, something that if lost could cause catastrophic and irreparable damage. And then trickling down from that, you've got what the courts describe as kind of mere confidence information. So something that it's nice for you to retain, customer client list, but can likely be developed elsewhere. Then we have something like um, what's called information that relates to the employee's skill and expertise in providing their role. And that is pretty much just how they do their job. So we can protect our confidential information but what we can't protect from is that individual going and performing their skills elsewhere, as long as those skills that relate to a use of or malfeasance in respect of our confidential client or customer lists. And then finally, you've got the lowest form of confidential information, which is called public information, which is something that you have already posted onto a website or provided to other individuals. So you can have, say, something like business modeling, forecasting, pricing information. That in and of itself could be confidential, but as soon as you start posting it out elsewhere, you can't expect it to be reasonably held as confidential. So the way we look in which to protect this type of information is generally through contracts for employment. So you can have many different ways in which you do it. Normally with employees, you're doing it through their contracts or a standalone non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement. Employees during their employment, even if they don't have contractual confidentiality provisions, are required to maintain confidentiality. They've got a few key and core obligations that goes along simply with being an employee, and it's called this duty of good faith and fidelity. So the duty of good faith and fidelity extends them acting honestly, disclosing any information that might be relevant. So not keeping shtum when you've got something that might be good for the employer, not making secret of profits from the employer's business, to respect the confidentiality that arises over business information and not to compete with the employer's business as well. Now, those obligations for employees arise out of their status as employees. So during their period of their employment, they have to serve you honestly. So if during that period of time, they start to remove information from the business, start trading with it elsewhere, making secret profits, diverting work, that's also something that would be in breach of their contract of employment. Now, if they don't have an express contract, the law will imply one for them. So you, you have to, within the first day of someone starting, provide them with a contract of employment. But if you don't, A, you're in breach of the Employment Rights Act, but B, what the courts will do is they'll look at what the actual agreement should have been. You know, what was actually in place? What was agreed between the parties? And that's always covered by these implied duties that employees have. It is probably, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a decent protection because we then know they're not gonna be able to trade against us. But to be frank with you, if you want to protect confidential information and show that it's so serious, you should have put that into an actual agreement. And that's where confidentiality after termination comes in. So implied duty of confidentiality, which is what I've just discussed there. So requiring them not to um, use your confidential information during their employment ceases at the time when they leave your employment. So if you want to protect it on an ongoing basis, you have to have it drafted into their contracts of employment. Now, these clauses are beneficial where you're going to be seeking to protect that when they go. And it's only really relevant if that employee leaves you, takes a big bunch of confidential information with them, and then starts to trade against you. Now, we all know, I mean, we've had tons of these types of cases where someone has just printed stuff off, they've tried to memorize it. I mean, the amount, the sheer amount of employees that I come across who have forwarded client lists to themselves from their work email, and they just simply deleted the email and think that it's gone, it's absolutely baffling. But the first port of call for any business when they suffer that is to make sure they're trying to get that information back. 
So A, you want to stop the damage. You want to get in touch with them, try and recover it from them. Normally that's through some sort of legal process. I use a sharply worded letter from Dean or myself requiring them to return it. And at that point we say, well, look, if there are any losses that flow from that, then we're going to pursue you for them. That's a darn sight easier if you've got a contractual obligation in a contract of employment or separate document in place. Because if you don't have that, then we're relying on those implied duties and they're just inherently weaker. And the obvious challenge to that is, well, if you thought so much of this information, if you wanted to protect it, if it's so important to you, why didn't you write it down? So they're having those confidentiality clauses it is key. The bad ones that I see, the, the worst confidential clauses are ones that are so blindingly complicated that no one can understand them. So, you know, it, 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 lawyers, we love, we love a bit of verbose language. I mean, I personally love using the word verbose whenever I can. And, um, you know, if, if we can put more words into things than we have a tendency to. But for an employee to understand their obligation of confidentiality, we don't want to blind them with legal terminology. What we really want from them is to understand, A, what is confidential to us? You know, our business models, our marketing plans, our pricing information, who we trade with, and then these aspects of potentially trade secrets, tell them, you know, that individual needs to have that information to be able to do their job. They should normally expect to understand what is confidential to a business and what is not. But the law does understand that people are lay people. So, you know, the, people come to me and they say, you know, they've taken all this client list. And I go back to them and say, well, why did you do that? And they say, well, I developed it. I'm the one who sat in the office and wrote out the Excel spreadsheet for my employer. Therefore, I created that document. Therefore, I own it. And whilst that is bafflingly ridiculous and also legally wrong, we, we're put to this position where that individual just simply didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know that that was an issue. So if you've got a confidential set of information and you really don't want them to, to remove that from you, just need to tell them about it. Confidentiality clauses, best way to go about it. States what they are, states what the protections that are over it, states what wants to happen when they go, and they shouldn't be removing that from the business. Um, a couple of clients I dealt with recently, they they had this as an issue. You know, they had, um, a, a, it was a recruitment business. They had a few people who had taken lots of client customer information with them when they've gone. So what they started to do was produce a load of um, recorded webinars. So when someone starts off, they give them the list of what the confidential information is. They explain to them what the provisions of the contract of employment say in respect of confidential information. And then there can be no dispute that they did not understand what they should have been doing at that point. Well, that leads me on really nicely into my practical tips sort of element here. You know, I know this, this topic is all about, about de-risking. And so de-risking de a business means <laughs> in a very simplest form, telling someone what to do. So I think, you know, having information marked as confidential, you know, a customer client list with a big stamp, block capital text in bold, confidential, do not remove. You know, I've had businesses who have had, you know, some pretty significant trade secrets. And what they do is they, they print out a number of numbered copies and have everyone sign them. And then they know exactly who's got a copy at each time. And if one's gone missing or it's been photocopied or it's been tracked, they know exactly where that's gone to. That's probably a little bit too much for most aspects of confidential information, but it's a good principle to use. You know, can we track where that's gone? Are we going to monitor that employee's emails when they're going to it? You know, do we have a policy in place that tells them what we're going to be doing when we're using work emails? Are we going to make sure that everything's password protected? Are we going to prevent them from saving things onto their personal devices? You know, it, it's, the, it's those aspects that are practically based for us and will help us in ensuring that that information doesn't go. Because first port of call is, and as, as much as suing employees is fun, um, we don't really want to be in doing it as a, as a business. You know, what we want to be doing is preventing that information from going, making sure that everyone understands what it is, and then protecting our business in that way. So I'm going to move on to my favorite topic at the moment, which is uh, protecting confidentiality for home workers. So um, I will put money on the fact that everyone who's listening to this call is either home working or knows someone who is home working. And it's probably quite likely that when this all kicked off and your, um, your employers or the business that you work for decide that your staff or were gonna go and do home working, that there wasn't too much regard given to protecting confidentiality because everyone was more involved in making sure that their staff roles were safe and making sure that they could continue to trade if they could continue to trade whilst working from home. 
But now what we've been seeing is um, a, an uptake in individuals who have started to cause issues in relation to confidential information. So again, on a, on a practical basis, what I've seen with remote working is individuals leaving documents out when they're at home, you know, not confidentially shredding things, um, printing stuff out of the office and then just carrying it home with them. You know, it's, it's those types of issues where if they were doing it under normal circumstances, you'd have a real issue with it. You know, you'd have a, you'd have a real problem with there being a potential that your confidential information could be, could be extracted elsewhere. But again, the issue that people, that businesses have come across is whilst they've got elements of home working and it's likely that in the future, most businesses will adapt to flexibility and will allow their staff to home work in the future. They just simply didn't tell staff what to do. So we had this situation where I, I worked with quite a large network of insurance brokers and they, they all, they home worked kind of immediately, but no one had a thought about what to do with the hard copy documentation. So again, we produced a homework agreement for everybody and it was a bit late to the game, but when they recognized the fact that there was a confidentiality issue, they decided at that point, right, well, people don't have secure spaces to work from at home. You know, there, there is no way to make sure that's secure. You know, fair enough, you might have a locked cabinet at home, but for an employer, you don't know who's in that room. You know, don't know who that is. And all this sounds incredibly paranoid, you know, and it, it probably is to, to some degree, but we want to know what's happening with our confidential information. So we're trying to get everyone to make sure they were storing everything electronically, but also that all that information was under password protection and also that we had control over those passwords too. There's, there's systems that you can use like password banks that generate automatic passwords for um, any information that you're sending out to staff to work from. Um, that's better if it's essentially controlled by us. So also we can change the passwords if we choose to. If that person's laptop, Surface Pro, um, I used a brand there, Apple Mac, um, employee, uh, you know, employee mobile telephone, you know, any of those get stolen, we want to know that we can lock that down almost immediately. So having, having a control over that is the best way to do it, you know, having it remotely accessed by us. If it's not going to be able to remotely access by us, having a password control over it is a, is a, good, um, a good backup plan. So there, with, with hard copy documents, again, when people are printing, taking it home, we have no continuity where the document is actually ending up. So it could be, they've done what they've stored it securely, um, it's just at home. It seems unlikely that they're going to be able to confidentially destroy that documentation. We, as in free, have a confidential um, disposal, it's all shredded, and I assume burnt and then scattered across things. Um, Actually, it's not scattered across. I have no idea what happens to it. I assume it's just shredded. Um, but most employees are not going to have that. You know, most employees aren't going to have that at home. And if it's shredded, what are they going to do with it? Just put it in a bin. So again, we need to have a recovery mechanism that works about getting that information back from them. Again, that's either in project employment, which is pretty unlikely at the moment, or it's going to be within a uh, home button agreement that you build up with these employees. And again, Final there, ensuring employees are actually aware of their confidential information obligations. So again, it's a core one that I have across at the moment. Having that written down somewhere and told to people, and better yet, having it on a webinar that you can provide to everyone and tell them to watch and then answer a few questions afterwards about what they're going to do with it is all the better. I, I know this is this type of advice, this type of webinar. I mean, I've been doing this for the last um, few months or so. You know, coming to it right now, it might seem that it's a bit late in the game. It's not, because you could have this in the future. You know, those individuals are going to continue to work. You know, they are going to continue to flexibly work. And we want to know what's happening with our information. And the best way to do that is to make sure that individual knows exactly what to do at each day. And then we've got those controls, we've got those systems in place. So I'll move on to ensuring ownership of intellectual property. I'm sure, I'm sure that many of you um, are absolutely fascinated, as I am, about the world of intellectual property and patents and designs and copyrights and trademarks. Yeah, yeah. Dean Gardner said that, you know, to be honest with you, these are, they are so technical and sometimes so interesting that the best way in which to protect them is to have them go through contracts of employment. So different areas of law that subscribe over different aspects of intellectual property. And 
The problem with it is that if you don't have that included in a contract employment, there can be a dispute about whether or not ownership of a patent, a design, a copyright, or a trademark vests with the creator, which would be the individual employee, or whether it vests with the owner, the property itself, the design that's created if it was a patent, and that would actually exist within the employer. Now, the vast majority of these issues don't particularly arise because there's, moral, there's an ethical code where an individual creates that piece of property during working time. Maybe just to interrupt, sorry. Could you just turn off your camera because I think your internet's breaking up a little bit. Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Here we go. Okay, let's see. Let's see if that works any better. Sorry about that, everybody. I've just been happily banging on, knowing that it was a problem. I continue to bang on. Um, we have jumped forward. So if you just pop me back on the slide, that'd be wonderful. So we're, we're looking at a kind of uh, ownership of um, those rights as they exist within employment. So look, if you are um, an employee, you're doing this for an employee, you're doing boring work time, you know, you're in that information that is part of your job role is to create designs to do copyrighted work you know over broad documentation or creation of ownership of trademarks those aspects can be offset by the individual employee's right to retain intellectual property as their own and i've had this recently with a client of mine who um they provide software designs for um, for their clients. They hold the IP marks on it. And a few employees were coming to them and saying, well, yeah, we, we know that our intellectual rights would transfer over to the employer. But if the employer doesn't want that, i.e. develop something that's actually useful, can we then keep that as our own? It's an interesting idea. It's really what we want to be doing most of the time as employers is making sure that we're protecting every aspect um, of our business. So we want to make sure that we own all the paint, we own all the design, we own all the copyright, and that's the way to have this to a employment. Now, people who came to us in that moment were saying, what well, we want to offset that, and the ability for the employer to then pass ownership through to us. It's fairly unique is what I've seen. First port was always to be putting up effective control provision to ensure that all we have to do at that point is say, well, no, they are all with ours. There's no right of refusal as such. They're just simply owning them. And drafting those contracts are important to protect them is often, often overlooked by businesses. The, the clauses within the contracts are fairly discreet. You know, they simply say, look, if you do this during working time in, in you know, on work system for a work purpose, then it's going to be up. But clarify that to that individual in a way they can understand and is definitely going to be beneficial and i have to say again with that with that client what we had was a ended up with what, memorandum understanding we um we eventually had a list of the key decision -making tool that we would use to decide whether or not ip was ours or whether or not we would refuse it, and whether or not that they would pass to the employee. But that was done in conjunction with the employees, and it actually became quite a good employee relations exercise because uh, we were with them, deciding who was owning that, um, owning that information, and then agreeing with them when they could take it. And not only did that empower that employee to say, well, look, this is going to be developed for you, this is good for you, but also it allowed us later on to potentially share in that right. Interesting one, key part from that, have it in your contract. If it's not in your contract, have it as a separate document, a separate standalone document that they sign that describes who owns patents, who owns designs, who owns copyrights, and who owns trademarks. So flipping on then to uh, the next slide. Marvelous. So this is all about um, preventing fair competition. So unfair competition is because whenever one leaves you, if you go to a competitive business or they set up in competition with you, that is not in and of itself inherently unfair. Now, them doing something that assists them in a commercial enterprise is protected by the courts. So the courts say, well, the right to trade freely, the right to set up a business is potentially competition with the last person you uh, were employed by is an inalienable right of every employee. 
So if they come to you, they you build up their skills, you build up their expertise and how they do their job, and they then choose to leave you and set up themselves, you cannot restrict that unless you have an agreed restrictive covenant in place or you have confidential information restrictions in a contract of employment that prevents them from using your information against you. So <coughs> the first topic I put on there, a could be employees. The crisis has, as far as I can see, it has increased the risk of employees using their time while they're on furlough, or potentially while they're on furlough, or away from the office in order to make further preparations to compete. Um, it's been quite a sad one. Um, very recently, I, I've seen quite a few um, individuals who have taken that time simply to use it to remove confidential information from their employers. Um, it's pretty distressing for all involved. You know, it's, it's it got down to a time where we were trusting them to be appropriate weight um, and then back to a renewed, be able to continue to trade and then use that government assistance in order to try to trade against us has been, you know, it's just, it's just a sad state of affairs. So what is a good, it's a good measure for everyone right now to start looking at their contracts of employment and to work out whether or not they do have restrictive covenants in place that then have termed as being under competition. So what we have as a business is a right to protect our trade connections. So customers, clients, suppliers, you know, all good, the right to protect trade secrets, and the right to protect the stability of our workforce. But the individual has the contrasting right to trade freely. So what we want to do is make sure that we've told that individual, well, look, when you come and work with us, we don't want to simply develop you so that you can go away and trade against us later on. And we want a reasonable period of time after you leave our employment, and certainly during our employment, where you won't undermine our business. Doing that within their employment is dead easy. It's covered by the implied rights anyway, but having it expressed in the contract, all the better. You know, it's just a nice little cherry on that cake if we can have a contractual agreement as well. When they go, they can compete against you unless you can prevent them otherwise. And the types of restrictive covenants you can have within your contracts of employment, there, 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 are, there are many numbers, of them, but the broad ones, what's called non-solicitation. So that's the, the positive act of that individual going out and contacting your clients. So, you know, they might have a client list. So if they're a sales, sales manager, they have a client list of um, customers that they work with. It will prevent them after the fact for a set period of time from contacting those customers directly and saying, hey, Joe Bloggs, I've now moved. Do you want to follow me to this new business? There's also um, what's called a non-dealing. Now, non-dealing, it works uh, in the opposite way to non-solicitation. So non-solicitation requires the positive of that individual to go out and seek um, and seek work, whereas non-dealing uh, is the prevention of that customer or client seeing that individual out. So say you say they move to an employer, they just sat there waiting for the work to come in, and the, the contacts or clients they were dealing with then seek them out and move over. Now, they would have to, with a non-dealing provision, refuse that instruction. What it's really trying to do is to, core, is to keep them on with a core set of principles to say, look, we want to maintain this customer client base that we've got. You, if it's you, you have to refuse it. If an individual not refuse it, then this comes to enforcement we'll touch on later on. The restrictive codes you can, you can have in there like non non poaching which uh, relates to kind of non employment of employees you know it, it's normally restricted to senior level or individuals who might cause us an issue if, if they went they might have to say specific knowledge of a, of a certain area or um they might have a particular um, down to us if they to leave and that's probably to prevent something like a team move so to prevent uh, an individual might be core to a business taking say their assistants with them their associates with them a, a training session that they might have done you know taking that over and then setting up a competition with us so it might be that those lower level employees won't cause them an issue as such but when put in conjunction with a more senior employee that's what would cause us that problem so non-poaching is a good way of ability for workforce 
the the poly the, those ones are, are kind of core non solicitation non dealing non poaching they're well recognised uh, as as enforceable as long as they're drafted quite well now the one that's the spicy one you know the one that is often challenged by the courts the general non competition covenant so telling that person that they cannot compete with us in a set industry for a set period of time now. That would only be worthwhile where that person you know, had either core knowledge in the industry or where it was something like a geographical restriction. So say like a dentist. Dentists get their patients from a set area unless they are specific or um, they do something like or a specific orthodontics or maxofacial surgery. So they would get their contacts and information from you know, three, a three mile radius. So it would be reasonable for a dental practice to say, do not trade as a dentist within three miles of our premises. Grand, that's fine. Hairdressers, nail technicians, beauty salons, again, same thing, normally within a set area. If you sell, I don't know, en engines to ships, you know, having a non condition in a set geographical area might be very beneficial to you. So trusting those covenants to, uh, you know, competition in a set area, or non-competition in a geographical area can be quite key, but the general principle of the courts is that non-competition are quite difficult to enforce. They are, they, they are look, they, a judge will look down their nose at you and decide whether or not that is a, a core part of your business that you need to protect and whether or not it would be better protected by virtue of the non cessation and non-dealing and non-poaching rather than chopping someone out of the industry for a set period of time. So there is some issues that we come across when drafting, um, when drafting kind of enforceable restrictive covenants. So I'm going to, I'm going to quickly kick this one back to, uh, to Dean. So know we had a quick chat about this, um, you know, in our planning session for this talk. And you said you had a good, good sort of war story about kind of the enforceability of restrictive covenants. Yeah, thanks. So it's yeah, it's like you said, it's it's something that that comes up quite often, and and it's not unusual to find an employee who wishing or um, trying to sort of push the boundaries of what they they can and can't get away with. And and the most recent example um, that I I dealt with came about uh, with an employee who'd clearly made or taken steps to um, get ducks in a row before they resigned and then so that they were then ready to go and, and, and effectively try and set up in, in competition around the corner, which whilst we can't necessarily stop them from uh, setting up in competition around the corner, what we can do is stop them from um, using um, our sort of know-how, as, as I like to call it, um, to to their advantage and, and, and to our detriment. And what what's generally involved in these circumstances, as as was the particular case that I dealt with, is 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 speed or, or time is very much of the essence. Because um, once the the horse has bolted, um, it's um, very difficult, and a judge um, is going to have real difficulty um, to put that horse back in the stable um, and you're then left in a situation where yes you might be able to bring a claim for damages against um, your former employer uh, sorry employee um, that might not be good enough for you if if that employee is has stolen a march on you stolen your customers um, nicked key personnel um, quite honestly, a check in the post further down the line in damages is, is not going to be sufficient. And that was something that was particularly of concern to, uh, to my client recently. Um, and thankfully, in those circumstances, the, the sort of sharply worded letter that you, you referenced earlier um, was, was sufficient to at least bring a realisation to the employee's eyes that, you know what I mean, we're not just going to sit back and allow this to happen. Um, and ultimately led to a situation where we were able to negotiate um, terms that weren't necessarily in the employment contract, but allowed um, the former employee to, to carry on and, and doing what they wanted to do, um, but without um, the, the benefit of, of our material, 
um, that we were able to ring fence in a side agreement that said, right, you've gone, you've left, you've done this, you've taken that, we'll let you off this, but you agree and undertake here, uh, not do that move forward. That's all good. And we were able to do that in, in these particular circumstances, but we didn't have great express contractual terms in the first place that we would use to bash the employee over the head with. So it goes back to your point, Toby, about if you've got those terms in the first place, it makes my job and your job a lot easier um, because we've got something that we can immediately go to court with. Whereas if you haven't got that, you're more in a situation where you're trying to negotiate, you're making the same threats and saying the same sharply worded letters, but um, with, without really having the teeth behind it to buy if, if push came to shove and the employee um, didn't cooperate as much as, as our particular one did. So it's, yeah, certainly food for thought that, you know, if it's in a contract, um, far better than not. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a great summary there. What, what, what I'd say as well is that for, um, for restricted covenants to be enforceable, um, you, you got to show two core bits. The, the part, I think I'm going to call them my, my essential aspects of recipe um, or sort of restricted covenants. So if, if there's a big pie, I don't know where I'm going with uh, analogy, I'm going for the pie analogy. If it's a big pie, then um, legitimate dietary interest is, is the first bit. That's our pastry, right? So we show we have an interest in what we're trying to protect. So trade secrets, stability of the workforce, goodwill. Those are the core aspects that we are looking for. If it does not protect a legitimate proprietary interest, I think that's quite nice for us to have, why not enforce it? Filling, I saw, I don't know, Apple, is that, that protection is no more reasonable sorry the protection is no more than is reasonable to have regard to that interest so if we've got a recital covenant that's worldwide for 12 months and are a beauty seller in work that's not going to be enforceable you know it's not a legitimate proprietary interest because we do not get that work from anywhere other than the two miles around 12 months is by far too long you know, it's one of those, it, it, it's all based on the circumstance at the time. Whereas if we were protecting a sales executive works worldwide and the clients and customers will renew every 12 months over rolling over every single month, then it's more likely 12 months to be found to be enforceable. 12 months is your absolute max. You know, that, that, that really is it. Um, but anything less than that, more more better and there can be quite a lot of nuances that come along with drafting enforceable restrictive covenants it is tempting i think to to get these from like on providers they're kind of everywhere you can get this, these draft terms um, and they're good you know they can be useful even if they're not enforceable to use as a means of saying to an employee look we're going to use these but let's reach a deal it's much better to have them drafted be nuanced be specific and appropriate to your business to make sure that they are going to be enforceable and they are reasonable and we can limit those down and as, as dean said you know the, the best way really that you can get out of these issues is with some sensible negotiation you know and it can be that the individual who's gone simply isn't sensible you know they're just going to continue to breach it anyway and that's yeah that's when you go and instruct mr dean hill to um hit him over the head with a stick you know but the vast majority of the time what you're getting to is someone who might not understand what they were doing took a chance it didn't pay off for them. They got to pay damages. That, that's, that's the punitive element there. And they got to make sure that we are business protected for the period of time that our restriction runs for. And that's a good outcome for us. It's, but it's better to prevent that from happening. And normally what we want to do is when someone's going, uh, if you have some enforced restrictions, a letter tells them that. It says, here you're going, best of luck. Here are your restrictions. This is what they mean. You've got to stick by them. Um, and that, that letter is really, really handy. So they don't come back to us and say, oh, hang on, I'm not agreeing to these, or, oh, hang on, I don't remember signing these or whatever. You know, it's, it's much better for us to then be able to evidence that not only have we got them, we reminded them of them, and they, therefore they, they were in flagrant breach. Now, you can put it into what's called settlement agreements. So settlement agreements are where you pay off an employee who either has caused you a problem, uh, you're settling with them, or you're doing it just out of the goodness of your heart. Um, you can stick restrictions into those, um, you know, again, 
restrictions in in settlement agreements are normally more readily enforced than they are in contracts of employment and that for that is courts look at contracts of employment as having uh, a an inescapable inequity of bargaining position so uh, an employer generally has more power because they they the boss they got the money and an employee generally has power because they want that job so normally when the uh, restriction offered the uh, courts will consider well was there really a choice for that employee you know was there an ability for them to say no i'm not going to have those restrictions and the answer will always be no because we would have withdrawn our job offer had they not agreed to those requirements as they did and i mean forcible you just give that inequality between them and it means you have got a bit more of a task to go about now in settlement agreements different kettle of fish because individual has to be legally advised about the content of the settlement agreement for it to be valid normally the employer pays for that advice and then what we can then show is not only were they paid a sum to leave they were probably paid a sum for the settlement agreement as well some for the restrictive covenants and they had legal advice you know at that point they can no dispute that that wasn't a reasonable restriction unless they go too far so if we come in and we're like why don't you do trading against for years the court will look at that and say, well ah, that's a bit too far because we don't look at that it's too it's not reasonable it's too far but if we're keeping them at the very top level and say well, yeah well we paid this person off and their solicitor will have told them that these are enforceable it can be a good means of having that just reiterated but also what you want to go with settlements if you are careful out of your business um, don't inadvertently leave all the restrictions settlement agreement saying this thing called entire agreement clause which means that if you if you've got a contract of employment and it had restricted covenants in, and then they sign a settlement agreement that doesn't mention those restrictions, they're waived. So I mean, I've had a few times when um, people have come to me afterwards once they've dealt with something and they say, "Well, oh, hang on, we this guy's trading against us now." And you say, "Well, yeah, because the settlement agreement didn't cover what he wanted it to cover." So now we've got to go about saying, "Was there another breach somewhere else?" It's definitely better to take advice on those points as well but yeah it's that aspect of you know de-whisking de that element do we have them if we don't have them can we get them in through a settlement agreement always a good way of dealing with it if we do have them let's make sure we don't waive them when we go through our settlement so very finally you'll be here I, on my last slide can we just move me on thank you very much it's just, just some practical topics about kind of stopping preparations to compete so you know, first pop call, monitoring confidentiality, always a good one. Um, I had, yeah, I had a, a, a very cheeky employee who recently said he was sending a load of information out from his work email to his personal email. We found out, uh, told him what a cheeky so-and-so he was. And he came back to us and said, ah, I've got an expectation of privacy over those emails. So you shouldn't have been looking at the private emails I was sending to myself. And if you are to pursue me, then I will shop you in to the Information Commissioner's Office for breach of data protection. Now, um, beside, beside me colouring blue and calling in quite a few names, he was also wrong. We had a, a policy in place that covered the fact that we would continue to monitor those employees and there was no expectation of privacy over the content of that email. This is a real grey area under the law. So employees who send themselves private emails on a work system do have an expectation of privacy over the contents of that correspondence if they mark it as private so we as an employer in that instance he was still he was thieving from us so you know we had the right to look at that to stop a a fraud or a criminal act anyway but we also had a policy in place that covered off the fact that we were going to monitor that so monitoring confidentiality is key, but having the background to it to say to them, well, A, your policy is in place tells you that we are going to monitor you. And also we've got um, a contract that says that we're going to monitor you as well. So there can be no argument that that individual knew we were doing and they were going to be. What we're trying to do is, as I said, we're trying to prevent them from taking that step. You know, we'd rather than not take it rather than sue them afterwards. Garden leave can be an interesting one as well. So garden leave is where you send someone home to be in the garden. So they can uh, be restricted from accessing your premises, restricted from contacting customers, restricted from contacting their work colleagues for the period of their notice. So you serve notice on garden leave and then they're out of the mix uh, for however long that would be. So senior execs, you're normally looking between three and six months as a, um, 
as a notice period. You can put them on Gardenly for the entirety of that period, but only if you have a contract that confirms that they can be put on garden leave, because there is a principle called the right to work. Um, the right to work means that they can, um, they can still come in and they can say, well, actually, I will be coming in office. I want to be doing this work because if I don't, um, then I'll lose all my skills and my expertise. So if you don't have that and we accidentally put them on garden leave without vision, it can be a breach and it puts them in breach and then they can't uh, have their any restrictive covenant enforced against them as well. So it's better to have that contract in place to make sure that you've got that all off. But also any time that they spend on garden leave will normally reduce the length of their restrictive covenants as well. So if you've got them chopped out, they've got a period of time where they're just working in the garden, not doing anything, shouldn't be contacting anybody, that will normally reduce the length of time that they're restricted after their employment ends. If you choose to pay them in lieu, so this is the pylon, so payment in lieu of notice, choose to pay them in lieu, um, and you don't have the contractual authority to do so, then that's also a breach of contract. So um, they will then be able again to say, well, actually, my restrictive covenants have been, have been waived by the fact that there's been a breach of contract and therefore I'm no longer restricted. Most people would prefer to simply be paid rather than um, have to work it out. But if they get that payment in lieu, haven't agreed to it and come and speak to a solicitor, we will say, well, actually, that's a technical breach and therefore you're not restricted at all. And it just puts them in better stead. So either we're looking for that agreement that person can accept a payment in lieu of notice, or preferably we've got a contract that allows us to take that step and allows us to serve notice in that way. And that is all from me. So I will throw you back to uh, to Dean. I can see that I was having a bit of um, connectivity issue. Um, hopefully my this did carry for everybody. Sorry about that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Toby. I think I think we've had uh, free to wide connectivity problems. So uh, apologies to everybody for that. What we'll what we'll do if there's any bits that you missed, or if there was any questions that you you, you couldn't quite get through, we'll um, we'll make sure you've all got Toby and I's email address afterwards. And if there's anything that you want to sort of follow up with, or or ask us about that that maybe didn't quite come through on the webinar, then then please get in touch and and we'll will happily um, get get back to you. Um, we do we do have a few questions, Toby, um, which I'm going to I'm going to start off with one from myself actually because, as as I warned during our prep um, yesterday uh, for this webinar, I'm going to throw you a question that you're not expecting. Yeah. So just to keep it <laughs> close. Um, you mentioned um, about um, the, the restrictive covenants and obviously geography and time scales and, and, and those type of things. I was just wondering, and this is not something that, that I've come across, but what are the dangers of, of overreaching with your drafting? So, for example, if, if a court determines that a, a, a restrictive covenant has been drafted too widely, um, does it throw it out the window completely or does the court or has the court the ability to um, reduce the um, the scope of it or, or indeed reduce the term or is it is it all or nothing? Um, it's a bit it's a bit of both in it. So you've got um, the potential that what a court will do was say, look, you cash your net too widely. That's it. You sunk. You know, it, 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 this, this provision in and of itself is not reasonable does not protect a legitimate proprietary interest and is therefore not enforceable. Or what well, they can look at is the intention of part of the time and do things like blue money when they go through and they amend it to a time bit of wind. Uh, Yeah, apologies, everyone. I, 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 I've got problems with Toby's connectivity now, so I'm, I'm guessing that everybody else has. Um, he went very crackly there. So again, apologies for that. So um, we do have a, a couple of other questions, which I'll, I'll try and deal with um, just while we've got to, a couple of minutes left. Um, one of the questions that has kindly come through is, is what, um, what you can do to terminate an employee but avoid a risk of them suing you afterwards. Um, something that 
touched up um, by reference settlement agreement um, and quite honestly and quite simply you, you, you're free to agree um, whatever terms you, you, you want to try and um, agree with your ex or soon to be ex employee um, but um, the important point is in turn for that, the employee um, signs up to an agreement whereby he waives or she waives any claims that she may have or he may have against you and, and for that to be um, legally effective the important point there is that, that the employee um, takes independent legal advice and so therefore fully understands um, what it is that he or she is signing up to that they're waiving all of their possible claims um, and that uh, you as the employer um, pay the real legal costs that go with that um, so uh, so yeah hopefully that's answered your question but again we're struggling with connectivity so a, a thousand apologies for that so we, we do have some other questions so what i was going to suggest um if, if tom's still here as well I'll, I'll close off today's webinar um thank you all very much for joining us today uh, and look forward to seeing you next time on on the 18th of august for the next in this series of webinars uh, i'll be joined by my colleague fiona woodhead um when we'll be continuing this de-risking for growth series by looking at shareholder and director disputes, uh, the importance of statutory registers and documenting your decision making. Um, and what we'll do is, as I say, we've, we've got some outstanding questions. So Toby and I will pick those up after the web. Circuit um, questions and answers and ones that we tried to deal with today to, to everybody. Um, and also let you have our contact details so that if, if there's anything that didn't quite come through in today's webinar, um, that we can pick that up with you um, and, and make sure you get the full benefit of, um, always back look, we get the full benefit of um, today's session. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and we will see you all on the 18th. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Sorry about that.